I want to start just by saying thank you. Uh, for the last 22 years, for those of you who've been around that long, you've been kind of carrying a pretty heavy load. Uh, and so have your families. And there are a lot of people in this room who've helped your families do that, from Airmen Family Readiness Centers, key spouses, etc. But all of you have shouldered a lot of this burden. Uh, you've been deploying, you've been redeploying, you've been training for the next deployment, uh, you've been sitting without flying because we ran out of flying hour money or it was taken away. You've been putting up with a whole lot of nonsense and through it all you've continued to do the Air Force's job in just a remarkable way all over the world. And I just want to say thanks for how well you do it. Uh, you make us proud each and every day, and this is one of the rare opportunities we get to just directly thank you for what you do. Um, let me recognize a couple of people who are in the crowd today, um, specifically. And uh, Mike Hill, if you could come up here, Michael, and, uh, and also Cheyenne, where'd you go? Cheyenne McGrew. One of the things that's interesting to me before I visit a base is I ask the guys to talk to the leadership at the base and say, do you have some people who really don't get a lot of visibility necessarily, but who are kind of really part of the fabric of your organization? And who kind of keep things running and take care of people or make the mission get better? Um, and I really meet some fascinating people this way, people I probably wouldn't normally get introduced to. And these are a couple of them. Michael is an electrician here at Spang. He's been here for about 16 years now. He's from Trier originally. He's married, has a couple of children. Um, and he works on the water system, the fuel system, etc. cetera here. Um, not too long ago, as just an example of what he does, the main water controller for the base here at Spang that controls everything, firefighting water, base water, everything, uh, failed. And there wasn't a spare one on hand. And so while everybody was kind of going into the panic mode about how do we keep water available for the, the families and the mission at Spang, Michael came up with a solution. Uh, he figured he needed 24 volts of power to fix this thing, so he hooked together two car batteries, ran it, ran it through some other gadgets, and plugged the system back in, and it worked. And he kept the system operating until the replacement controller could show up. He's the German MacGyver. <laughs> The people he works with and for here will tell you that he's kind of like this all the time. He comes to work every day hoping to learn something new and trying to make something better, uh, which should be the goal of everybody in this room. I know that's what the chief and I try and do. And Michael, you're now a role model for us. Thank you for what you do for the, for the Sabre. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. Cheyenne actually started doing this with the United States Army, she and her husband both. Now he's in the CE squadron and Cheyenne works as the lead key spouse for the 52nd Civil Engineering Squadron and she's got a herd of others. There's I think 11 others or so who help out in doing this job. Betty and I and Athena and Jim Cody travel all over the world and we talk about the key spouse program everywhere we go. We get to meet key spouses, we see the impact they have and in the places where it doesn't work well, we see the need for it. Um, She's been doing this for a while, six, seven years now as a key spouse. She's done a phenomenal amount of work here for the CE squadron, and she also serves as the school liaison officer for the wing because she has a background in education. She's taught in high school, she's taught in universities. She believes in the power of education and the impact it has on our children and eventually on our nation. Uh, she's committed her time, her energy, to making everything better that she can affect. I don't know how many airmen, how many families she's, in, she's helped, but I'm sure between her and the network she supports and manages, it's a ton. There's no way for me to thank her enough for that. I don't care if it was just one airman she helped. And she's helped hundreds, if not thousands. Cheyenne, thanks for what you bring to our Air Force. Thanks for being such a valuable part of it. Thanks for having the people you work with cheering for you. That tells me an awful lot. Ladies, thank you for what you do and for being here today. And all of you who do key spouse work, I don't know how to say thank you enough for what you do. We don't pay you. We don't reward you appropriately. I know you do it because you think it's important, and I hope you get something out of it, but I guarantee you we do. So thank you, ma'am, for leading them. Thank you, sir. I'm going to mention one other just great airman today because this is the day we bury him. 
And he's an important name to our Air Force, and I want to make sure we haven't all forgotten. His name was George E. Day. He went by Bud. Uh, Colonel Bud Day died last Saturday down in Shalimar, Florida. Uh, Bud Day started his military career at 17 years of age. He, in 1942, he enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. And for the next almost three years, he fought in the South Pacific as a United States Marine. He earned 12 major campaign stars fighting as a Marine on the ground in the South Pacific. Really, really rugged duty. All those ugly places you've heard of, Bud Day fought there. He came to the United States Air Force in 1951. Actually, in 1950, he joined the Air Guard. In 1951, he came in on active duty in the Air Force because he wanted to get back to flying. He fought in Korea. He fought in Vietnam. Uh, became kind of a nationwide name during the Vietnam War because he was one of our POWs. Uh, he was flying an F-100 as a squadron commander of a group that did the Misty Fact mission, a forward air control mission that was really dangerous back in those days. Uh, in April of 1967, he was shot down. He was captured as soon as he hit the ground. He was tortured for two days because he wouldn't say anything to his captors. By the way, when he bailed out of the airplane, his right arm was broken in three places. Uh, after being beaten for two days, he was hung upside down in a cave. His body was so mangled they didn't think he could escape, so they didn't pay a lot of attention to him. And on the sixth day, he escaped. And he evaded for the next two weeks, moving from North Vietnam all the way into South Vietnam. Uh, on about the second day of that evasion, he was lying in the jungle one night and a, a bomb went off nearby, dropped by an American airplane. And he was actually hit by the frag. His leg was cut and wounded badly. He was uh, lost his equilibrium. He was probably a little bit in shock, a little bit of a traumatic brain injury. And he had to rest for a day or two before he continued going south, evading North Vietnamese patrols that were looking for him. Eventually, he got within about two miles of a Marine outpost, U.S. Marine outpost, Knew enough as a former Marine, I probably shouldn't try and walk in there at night. Uh, and so he laid in the jungle to wait till the next morning when the light came up so they could see he was an American. Unfortunately, when he woke up, there was a North Korean soldier pointing a rifle at him. He tried to run again, he evaded for another two days, but in that initial evasion, he was wounded twice, once in the hand and once in the leg. He was eventually recaptured, taken back to the camp he left from where he was brutally beaten again. Eventually, he moved toward uh, Hanoi. They put him in a camp called the Plantation, where he roomed with Senator John McCain, among others. I helped nurse Senator McCain back to health. Senator McCain then helped nurse him back to health. It's an amazing story. Bud Day became famous for his resistance among the prisoner, prisoners of war. He never, never gave up, no matter how bad his body was mangled. His spirit never broke. Probably the most famous incident that I've heard of Bud Day while his time as a POW was when there was an, a forbidden religious service going on. The North Vietnamese discovered it, charged in, pointing rifles at the prisoners who were engaged, and Bud Day stood up and just walked up to the rifles and stood there and started singing the Star Spangled Banner. Now Admiral, retired Admiral James Stockdale, who was a senior POW, stood up and sang with him, as did everybody in the camp by the time they were done. Now think about the courage that would take. After five and a half years, he was released. He returned home, came back on active duty, actually retired after serving as a vice wing commander down to the 33rd wing at Eglin Air Force Base. He is just a great, great American hero. Bud Day wore over 70 military decorations, 50 of those for combat. Now think about that for a second when you're looking at your ribbon rack. Here's a couple of the citations he was presented. The Medal of Honor, the Air Force Cross, the Silver Star, the Distinguished Flying Cross, four Bronze Stars with Valor Device, four Purple Hearts. What an incredible life. What an incredible career. What an incredible man. What an incredible airman. An example and a role model and hopefully an inspiration for all of us. Today they'll bury him in a national cemetery in Florida. There'll be a whole lot of United States Marines and a whole lot of United States Airmen there honoring him and his family. And I just wanted to remind you that today was the day. We lost an icon, but we're still following his example. Rest in peace. Folks, one of the cool things about coming out and seeing wings again is I'm reminded of uh, how talented you are and all the great things you do. Who's the youngest Airman in here, do you think? Yeah, not, no, Haji. <laughs> Somebody point me at a really young airman so I can embarrass him. Okay, where are we at? 
Was there somebody over here? Oh my God. We got the photographer right here. <clears throat> you think it's important work? Let me ask you a question. When the next conflict starts, or the 52nd wing is responding to a next major contingency, and somebody's trying to capture the history of this thing so we learn the lessons, so we can add to the heritage, so we can remind ourselves of what we did and how we can do it better in the future. And you're out there documenting the effort, whether it's with your camera or your writing articles, helping to contribute to the history of that conflict. During that space of time, who's more important to the United States Air Force? You or me? <laughs> No, there's no well sirs allowed here. It's, it, it, you, got, you got two choices, you or me. I would, I would say it's myself, sir. Yeah, you. Clearly, it's you. And you need to do me a favor. You, you got to promise me that you'll never forget that. I don't care how long you stay in this business or what you end up doing. Never forget that. Everybody in this business is critically important to what we do. Everyone. I don't care if you wear a uniform, you wear a coat and tie. I don't care. You're all critically important to what our Air Force does. And you deserve to be treated that way, and, and you deserve to be recognized for what you bring to this fight. That's one of the things the Chief and I try and tell people wherever we go. This business is about pride as much as anything else. It's about hiring great people, training them as well as you can, educating them better than anybody else does, and then making sure they understand that they can be the best in the world at what they do, just like you can be. And when they work hard to get to that point, we gotta make sure they understand how impressive it is. You guys have no idea how good you are at what you do. You're too close to it. Think about the success story that is the United States Air Force. We've never had a mission we didn't accomplish. There's never been a conflict that we haven't dominated. Heck, in the first Iraq war, Saddam buried his airplanes rather than take them off after the first night. I mean, think about that for a second. It's incredible what this Air Force does. We have about 15,000 people every single day who do nothing but fly satellites and do missile warning for the United States of America, 24-7, 365. They never quit doing it. We have about 25,000 people who do the ISR mission all day, every day. They run, they run infrastructure, they move data, they do collection management, they move stuff to analysts. It's happening 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. We've got about 50, we got about 35,000 to 45,000 people, depending on who, which missions you include in it, who do the nuclear mission and sit nuclear alert and manage two thirds of the nation's nuclear triad. Every day, all day, all the time. We've got about 100,000 people who do the air mobility mission. You see them in and out of here all the time. A U.S. Air Force airlift mission is taking off every 90 seconds, every hour, every day of the year. That's a lot of airlift. We got about 55,000 people who do nothing but command and control all the time, supporting combatant commanders around the globe. Overall, our Air Force has about 208,000 people on any given day who are supporting real life operations from home station all the time. It's part of our Air Force that's kind of behind the operational curtain that most people never see. The people in front of the curtain are you folks who deploy out and get this job done. There's folks here from the MUNs and others who are part of that behind the curtain force. We've been 100% successful in every one of those jobs since the service became independent. Because of you. Every now and then, step back from what you're doing, kind of look at the overall picture and pat yourself on the back. Acknowledge how good you really are and tell your people because they're incredibly impressive. I got a great picture at home. It's of my dad and my son, John. My dad was an Air Force officer for 34 years. He was a pilot as well. Um, John was going through pilot training at Columbus Air Force Base a few years back and he asked dad if he would pin his wings on him when he graduated. And so dad said, I'd be honored to do that. Um, he told me about that. He was really, really proud. A couple weeks later, John calls me and he goes, hey, Dad, you, did you know that Pop-Op is out buying a new uniform? And he's, he retired like 25 years before that. He's out buying a new service dress. He's getting new ribbons. Would you tell him he doesn't have to do all that? So I called my dad and said, hey, you know, John doesn't think you need to do all that. And my dad got kind of mad at me. 
And he goes, Mark, those wings, that specialty badge I'm pinning on his chest, deserve my respect. And they're going to get it. <laughs> so I backed off. And so there they were with Dad in his service dress with his ribbon rack, which was significant. Um, he also fought in three wars. Uh, and his silver insignia and rank, because back then they weren't, you know, whatever the shiny stuff is we have now. Theirs were, his were minted at the Balfour Mint in Philadelphia. He'd polished them up, new, new uniform, and he showed up to pin the wings on my son's chest. And Betty and I have this fantastic picture of it. I don't know which one's prouder, but the two proudest people in the area were the people behind the camera. Not long after that, a year and a half or so, my dad died. And after he died, uh, my mom said, look, he has some instructions. You have to go to this safety deposit box, and he's got some instructions in there for what to do after he dies. So we, we went to the safety deposit box, we opened it up, and there's a book in there. And the book is titled The Croak Book. And it was written by my dad for when he croaked. <laughs> You, you guys would have liked my dad. And it had everything from, you know, what, what do you do at the funeral to how, here's my insurance accounts, and it was pretty phenomenal. I hope I'm smart enough to do this for my kids. The first thing in there, number one, bury me in my service dress. So we did. And when I saw him laying in a casket in that service dress, I started thinking about the life he'd led when he was wearing the uniform. Fought in three wars towed a glider across the beach at D-Day, dropped airlift supplies or airdrop supplies to Patton's army during the Third Army's breakout from the Bocage country across France, flew a glider into Germany with the 11th Armored Cav Regiment and the largest glider assault in history. When he hit the ground, the last guy out of the glider threw him a rifle and he said, that's the first time I ever thought about how we got home. I was pretty excited about the glider flight. So he fought with the infantry across northern Germany for four or five months, earned five major battle stars. And then he went on to a career, you fighter guys will understand this, 11,200 hours, 9,800 of those in fighters. And that's not going to happen again. He also earned the Silver Star, five Distinguished Flying Crosses, more Air Medals than you can count, nominated for the Medal of Honor in Vietnam. My dad was the real deal. What he was more than anything else, though, was proud of being an airman. He loved the Air Force. And I've got to confess, I picked it up from him. But I didn't understand until I got in. I liked the airplanes. And then I fell in love with the people. So every now and then do me a favor and step away from the job you're doing and the frustrations of the day and, and really look at the people around you and realize how lucky you and I are to be working with them. And remember that those great people, plus the pride you help instill in them by being part of a team, equals performance. And for our Air Force, performance is the only bottom line. It's the only one. The only report card the nation will ever give us is how we do in the next war. They won't care how well we treated our people if we lose the next war. But we're smart enough to know we won't get that kind of performance that guarantees victory if we don't take care of our people. So let's talk about how our people are doing for a minute. Chief and I have been doing this since the end of last year. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the road. We've talked to an awful lot of airmen. Operationally, our Air Force rocks. It's fantastic. The people are tired. Families are tired. Most of you have known nothing but a deployment cycle since the day you came in the Air Force. And you've accepted it. You're living up to that oath you took. And you're doing it proudly. But you're a little tired of it. Your families are a little tired of it. And now we've got all this other confusion going on about budgets and the future and what's going to happen to the Air Force. And we've got lots of questions out there. We owe you answers. And we take that responsibility very seriously. There's lots of decisions that haven't been made, but they're kind of coming together about right now. And so if you've got questions about any of that, we'll answer them and we'll answer them honestly about where we think we're going. Uh, but the bottom line is, at the end of all this, we'll still be the best Air Force on the planet. We may look a little different, we may be smaller, but we're still going to be better than anybody else has ever dreamed of being, because you're not going to let anything else happen. And we're going to make sure you won't tolerate anything other than that. So that's kind of where we, I think we stand. Um, there's three keys to us going forward in my mind. First one is common sense. Uh, we got to get rid of some of the nonsense we've been doing since we had 700,000 people on our Air Force. We've got instructions that were written 20, 25 years ago that we're still following almost blindly. Now, we've still got a structure in place that thinks that wings support headquarters, which support the air staff. 
That's exactly wrong, by the way. The Air Staff's job is to support major commands. Their job is to support numbered air forces, and their job is to support the wing. And by the way, wing staff, your job is to support squadrons. We've got to turn this back around. Um, so common sense is going to be important to us. The other thing that we got to work on in the common sense arena is that we got to start thinking really hard about what our people are really frustrated by, where they're wasting their time, where they're wasting their energy. And you can't fix everything without resources, but there's lots of things you can affect. When we opened up the Every Dollar Counts campaign here not long ago, uh, every, a lot of people thought it was a kind of a reincarnation of the IDEA program or any number of other names we give a program looking for better ways of doing business. The reality is we did it because I wanted to have the conversation I'm about to have with you. We did it for 30 days so we could cut it off and then say, okay, why did 11,000 airmen have to go to a website to throw out a good idea? Is it because their supervisors aren't listening to their good ideas? Is it because their commanders aren't allowing them to implement them? Is it because nobody asked them? Is it because they don't feel comfortable speaking up? I don't know the answers. But of the 11,000, I'm getting best than 80 to 85% of them are wing level and below suggestions. They're not huge Air Force things. A couple are, but most of them are not. And so all I'd like to tell you is that the chief and I are, I think, of a common mind on this. We're a little concerned that everybody has pulled decision making up every level that they could. And now people at levels below that, whatever that level is, are afraid to make decisions. And I'm here to tell you, I trust the wing commander to make decisions affecting this wing. And I expect him to trust the group commanders, the squadron commanders, the flight commanders, the senior enlisted leaders, the command chief, and that chain to make decisions that affect our airmen and the mission. And I expect him to make the right decisions, and I'm going to give him full authority to do it. So if you're doing something that's wasting your people's time or wasting money, and it doesn't benefit the mission or benefit your people, then quit doing it. And just tell your supervisors you're going to quit. You'd be astonished how many things like that are out there. I could go into a long list if you're interested, but I'll save it. But there's lots of examples of this. Let me give you one simple one that started right here at Spang. Was anybody here when I came here as a USAFE commander several years ago at a commander's call? Remember we had kind of the same conversation a little bit, and the first question was from a two-striper in the motor pool. And the two-striper said, hey, have you ever heard of the Form 1800? And I said, uh, no, because I, I didn't know the form number, because I'd never looked at it. But the Form 1800 is the form that's in every vehicle in our Air Force, and it basically says every day, whoever's using that vehicle has to check the tire pressure, the water pressure, the brake fluid, the, you know, everything, which you guys always do, I know. <laughs> the chief does. That form's been around since before I came in the Air Force. But nobody ever fills it out. Actually, that's not true. Somebody does. Because everybody who runs a motor pool in the Air Force knows that nobody fills it out. Especially if it's a you drive it vehicle and somebody's using a TDY. And so every night, somebody from the motor pool wanders around the base and finds all those vehicles and fills out that form. That happened to be the two striper who asked me the question. So what do you think that guy thought about the United States Air Force? This is the dumbest place I've ever been. I don't blame him. So in USAFE, we decided the next day that we could still do that form. This is USAFE headquarters. I have no idea what really happened to Spangdalem. We decided that we would do it for fire vehicles, for police cars, for weapons load vehicles, for things that you really should check every day. And the rest of it just stop. And I called the Air Force A4 at the time, Lieutenant General Lauren Reno. I said, hey, we just quit using that form over here. Let me know if you have a problem with that. I haven't heard back yet. <laughs> you can do that. We should do that at every level of this Air Force. If we want to get better, if we want to make it a place people like working, where they feel challenged, where they feel empowered to really use their full potential, that's where we need to go, guys. So common sense is the first key. The second key is communication. This is a little bit about that. Uh, we got to do a better job of communicating from big Air Force down to airmen. We're terrible at it. We're trying hard, but it just isn't working. Somewhere in the middle, everything disappears. 
I don't know why, but it, it, that's what's happening. Uh, we put out lots of information about every decision we make on the air staff. I don't know where it goes to, but you're not hearing it. Some of it's coming through command chains, some goes through functional chains, some goes through media chains, but it's not appearing where everybody can have access to it. And some of it is that if you're under 30, you take in information a little bit different than I do. You want it in a different form, a different format, different style, different gadget. We just gotta figure this out, because you deserve answers. Our job is to get them to you, so we're working that pretty hard. And by the way, the other thing that's important about communication is you guys communicating with the people you lead and supervise. The number one request I get from airmen when I go all over the world and say, what should we be doing more of? The one thing they say more than everything else combined is things like bring back roll call. I wanna see my supervisor. I wanna to talk to my commander. I wanna see my chief. I don't want an email once a week. Tell us how we're doing. Tell us you don't like what we're doing. Explain why we're important. It's really astonishing how consistently this message comes across. You guys can fix that today if you haven't already done it. And the final thing we gotta do to be successful going forward is we gotta care about each other. You do now, but we gotta take this to another level for lots of reasons. There's a lot of trauma in our Air Force because of these last 22 years of deployments. There's trauma inside families. There's trauma inside marriages. There's trauma in individuals, whether it's traumatic brain injury, PTSD, or just trauma over this lifestyle that's been very difficult to manage. There's people who are hurting a little bit. All the resiliency indicators are going in the wrong direction. They're not horrible compared to the rest of the planet, but they're not where we want them to be. So we gotta care a little more about each other. Chief Cody has a really interesting thing he probably talked to you about last time he was here. We're here basically just gonna get in your face and challenge you. And he'll ask somebody in the crowd, who's your best buddy? And often it's the person sitting next to him. And then he'll say, you give me 90 seconds, I'll know more, I'll know more about your best friend than you do. And you get kind of this, yeah, you know, yeah, right, look. And then he proves it. And he does it not by some cosmic method. It's not the Vulcan mind meld. It's, it's basically just asking questions. Do you have grandparents? Are they still alive? How are your parents? Are they together or do they divorce? Do uh, you have pets? Do you like dogs? Do you have a dog back home? Now tell me about your dog. Do you have kids? What do your kids do? Do they play sports? Do they do arts? What, what do they do? It's really incredible how in 90 seconds, how much this guy can learn about the person sitting next to you. And it's a great object lesson for all of us. I'm not gonna lecture you about sexual assault today or about suicide or about anything else, but let me just ask you a question. If your best friend walked into your office today and they hadn't seen you in five years and they didn't say a word, they just sat down, could you tell if they were having a good day or a bad day? What do you think? Sure. Because you know them, you, you pay attention to them, you kind of pick up on their body language, you've been around them, you learned about them, you, you, you know them. If Airman Smith or Lieutenant Jones walks into your office tomorrow morning and sits down and doesn't say a word, can you tell that they were sexually assaulted last night? Uh, obviously not, because 84% of our victims never report and we never know what happened. Why is that? Why don't we know them well enough to pick up on the same things you pick up on with your best friends? Why is it that when an event has occurred which causes someone's whole life to implode, the worst event they'll ever experience in their life, that 86% of the time they don't feel comfortable coming to the people who say all the time that we care about them, we'll take care of them and we'll die beside them if necessary. Why don't they trust us enough to turn to us for help? I don't know the answer, but if we can figure that one out, we can fix the problem. And until we figure it out, we never will. All these things are about people to people. They're not about corporate air force and big programs. It's about knowing each other better. If we know more about each other, we'll care more about each other. I was the wing commander at Kunsan. I was standing in a hallway. I tell this story a lot and I'm gonna tell it again because it's an important story. I'm standing on the sidewalk with my command chief. We're at a 4th of July picnic. We look up and there's a guy walking down the sidewalk coming toward us. And he's got jean shorts on, combat boots. He's got no shirt. He's got big nipple rings in with a chain between them. And that chain's connected by another chain to a dog collar around his neck with big silver spikes on it. 
And the chief, and by the way, he had a hit, that Hitler hairdo with goth black hair, you know, shaved on one side and iron kind of over to the side. And the chief and I looked at each other and went, man, there's something wrong with this. Now, we didn't have all those old rules we used to have for you know, tattoos and piercing and all that, now that we have those. So we were looking for a rule, but we couldn't come up with one, so we just went and gave him some fashion advice, which I, I know he enjoyed. <laughs> After talking to him, we kind of walked away going, that's a great kid. He was a staff sergeant, F-16 crew chief, by the way, guys. <laughs> um, but a great guy. And I really enjoyed talking to him. And over the next few months, I flew his airplane a couple of times. By the way, he wasn't a good crew chief. He was a fantastic crew chief. Really a great, great professional uh, on the flight line. I got to see him a couple times a week as I drove around the flight line at night. He was on the swing shift, so I saw him routinely. Friday nights, I'd take Pete's out there. He'd sit on the back of the Jeep with me, and it was one of the guys who was always there. He's an Indianapolis Colts fan. He's got a couple of brothers, big sports nuts. They were big, very competitive in the family. He had a Rottweiler that he couldn't bring overseas, really bugged him, he couldn't bring it with him. I mean, I knew, got to know a little bit about the guy. Several months later, I'm in my office doing an email one night, and there's a knock on the door, and I look up, and here's the staff sergeant. And he's got his brand new supervisor, a tech sergeant, had been there for four days, is with him. And behind him is the shirt, the chief, the squadron commander, all looking really not happy to be there. And the tech sergeant drug him into my office, and he said, boss, you've got to fix this. And I mean, all these things started going through my brain. Oh, he took his shirt off, he had the nipple rings in. I mean, you know, what, what happened out there? Um, and then his tech sergeant goes, no, nah, nah. The problem is his daughter. And he tells me about the guy's daughter. She's four years old. He left Hill Air Force Base to come to Kunsan, and then he was on a follow-on to Spangdal in Germany. His, his wife had been arrested for drugs shortly after he left. By the way, that's why they got the divorce. They'd been fighting about this for a couple of years. He told her, I can't be around that. You've got to stop. She would stop and start again, and finally he said, that's it, I'm out of here. They had a very contentious divorce. He didn't want to tell anybody about the drug use, so his wife won the custody battle. He came to Kunsan. His daughter stayed in Utah. His wife got arrested, charged, and convicted of felony drug sales. She was going to prison. Custody hearings going on for their daughter. The judge said, you got to be in court in Salt Lake City on Monday or you can't compete for custody. And whoever's going to get custody has got to live close enough that I can see this little girl every couple of months. I'm worried about her. Good for him. So they tell me the story. So we made some phone calls, talked to the judge, confirmed all this, called AFPC, got a guy named Jim Green who ran the assignment division at some ungodly hour. I woke him up at home, told him the story. He said, what do you want? I said, I want him assigned to Luke. And he said, okay, great, when's he got to be there? And I did the, <laughs> uh, this is Friday night in Korea. I said, he's got to be there Sunday. So he said, okay, put him on a plane and the orders will meet him there. And so we did. Chief and I gave him a little fashion advice before he left about what you wear to a custody hearing, and he headed out. A couple of months later, I, I meant to do an email again one Friday night late, and I opened up an envelope that I didn't recognize the writing on, and a picture fell out of a little girl sitting on a llama, and he's standing behind her. And the thing just said, thank you, I have full custody of my daughter. This is at her fifth birthday party at an animal farm near Flagstaff, Arizona. Great story, isn't it? There's a really important question that comes with it. Why didn't I know about Lori? Any guesses? Never asked. I never asked him. I, I don't know why. I ask everybody about their family. But I didn't ask him. Uh, dog collar, maybe? I don't know. Funny, but not. I never asked him. I knew all about the football team. I knew all about his dog. I knew about his brothers, but I never asked him if he had a family. By the way, neither did my command chief, neither did the group commander, the group command chief, the squadron commander, the squadron chief, the squadron first sergeant, the three flight chiefs he'd had in his time at Kunsan so far, or the four supervisors he'd had. None of us asked the question. Luckily, there was a young tech sergeant who'd been there for four days who was leading that guy, because nobody else was. I almost cost him a family. I almost cost her her father. 
because I didn't ask the question. Every airman has a story. Folks, you gotta learn the stories. The stories are exceptional, they're, they're inspirational. Some of them are a little sad, some of them are incredibly motivating, but everybody in this room has one. If you don't know the story, you can't lead the airmen as well as you could otherwise. It's really that simple. So do me a favor, would you? Learn the stories and then tell them. It'll make our Air Force a better place to live. Okay, um, let me make one comment here uh, that I, I kind of left till now, then I'll let the chief make comments and I got one thing I'd like to close with. And, and let me talk to the civilian employees here who have been affected by furlough. Um, furlough is horrible. It's a breach of faith. With part of our workforce that's involved in every mission area and some, sometimes they are the mission area completely. Uh, for the last three years, our civilians haven't been given a pay raise. Uh, Congress has protected uniform members and given them a pay raise, but our civilian workforce hasn't received one. And their reward for years of dedication, criticality to the mission, the great work they do, after no year, three years with no pay raises is to be furloughed and to give up as much as 20% of their pay for the rest of the year. This is horrible, and I'm sorry. Uh, the Secretary and I are doing everything we can every day to figure out a way to get around this. Uh, so is the Department, by the way. I understand why Secretary Hagel made the decision he had to. We got to the point where we had so much of all of our military that was not training at all that if any new contingency began, there wouldn't have been the ability to respond. And he couldn't put the country in that position. I, I understand it. It's not as simple as we could have moved some money from something else to pay this bill. We didn't have the money. Civilian pay, flying hours, weapon system sustainment, the maintenance stuff that goes with flying hours is all in the same account. It's all in our operations and maintenance account. And what sequestration did is took a flat percentage off of that account and just took the money away. To move money into that account requires congressional approval and they have not given it. <coughs> and we've asked multiple times. So that's the problem we face. In order to be able to keep flying, squadrons trained to respond to places like Syria, North Korea, wherever, we've got to take money out of the O&M account. That comes out of the pockets of our civilians. The tuition assistance issue, when people complained about that also comes out of O&M accounts, by the way. The tuition assistance issue, when Congress directed us to put money back in for the remainder of this fiscal year, we paid about another $100 million out of our O&M account to go back in and pay tuition assistance again that grounded two fighter squadrons. That also added to the reason for furlough. These things are all connected, guys. There's reasons that we make decisions. Um, and we, we, the chief and I agree, that was a bad one. We shouldn't have put money back into tuition assistance this year because it cost us too much in other ways. We understand tuition assistance is a big deal. It's important. And we've got to support it over time. but. Right now is not the time to take $100 million out of readiness and put it back in there. When you could have used the GI Bill or you could have waited if you didn't have to have the points this year to complete the degree in FY14. A lot of you don't have to agree with that, you probably don't, but that's the impact. There's an impact of everything we do, it's all connected. Um, anyway, so for you civilians out there, my apologies. We'll continue to work this hard. We're looking for options even this year to figure out how we can buy back more days so we don't continue this through the end of the fiscal year. And uh, I hope we're making progress. I don't know. We don't get to make that decision. But Secretary Fanning is working this one really, really hard. He understands the pain. Okay, Chief. So, uh, thanks, Chief. I, I would just leave this, certainly on behalf of Athena and I, we thank each and every one of you and your families for all you do as the kind of Chief opened up. And, and what I would ask you just to kind of put some context to everything that's going on and that you can kind of tell what everybody's thinking just by the questions. Know how much faith we have in each and every one of you every day to continue on doing what our Air Force needs you to do and know how much we appreciate and understand how well you continue to do it despite all these challenges that you hear about. There's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot less answers and that doesn't help you stay focused on the mission that we really do as an Air Force and as a nation need you to focus on. What I would ask you to do is stay focused on the mission. Keep your eye on the ball. What I do promise you, and every time I sit in a meeting with the Chief, with the Secretary, 
and we're going through all of these things and everything is on the table and you read things that the Secretary of Defense is talking about because he has to put it out there and make sure that our political leadership understands the impacts of some of these things. It creates this. Know that your Air Force leadership is 100% committed to ensuring you have what you need to do the mission. Understanding the impacts that every one of these decisions has on you individually, has on your families, has on your fellow airmen. So if you have faith in us that we're going to represent you well, I think it will give you more focus on the things that really are in front of you every day. And that is the mission. We run great risk taking our eye off a no kidding mission that happens every day. You're doing great for us. I ask you to keep doing that. And we'll keep you informed. And we will continue to try to make the very best decisions we can as an Air Force. Thanks, Chief. Um, not long ago, somebody asked me what I like most about being in the Air Force, because I've been doing it a long time, so I must like something. Um, and I told them I don't really like being in the Air Force. I love being in the Air Force, but not for any of the reasons that they expected. Uh, and the thing I think I love most is kind of a strange thing, but I think you'll understand what it is. My new buddy there, the photographer, I met him about an hour ago. But I'd die for him. And I wouldn't think twice about it. And I'm just naive enough to believe that if it really mattered, he'd do the same for me. That's why we wear a uniform. That's why we serve the nation. That's the oath you took. That's why I love you. That's why I'm still in the Air Force. Thanks for your time today, guys.